Good morning, online viewers. I want to welcome you to worship on this Ascension Sunday. Thank you for joining us at Victory Memorial United Methodist Church in Guyman, Oklahoma. It is our hope and prayer that you will hear the gospel loudly and clearly today, and that you will sense the presence of God with you wherever you may find yourself this morning. We remind ourselves that the greatest gift of all is God himself. Jesus lived, died, and rose again so we can know God and have an eternal relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please join us as we read, sing, pray, and celebrate Christ and our relationship with God in Christ. My name is Danny Moore, and I am grateful to know Christ and worship Christ with you today. As we celebrate Memorial Day tomorrow, we remember our fallen heroes and honor all who are serving and sacrificing themselves on our behalf. Now let us center ourselves and lift up the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Now would you join me in our call to worship. Thank you, Father God, that your ear is not deaf to our cries. How wonderful that your arms are quick to embrace us. Forgive us and help us. We rejoice in being your people, the sheep of your pasture. We eagerly listen for your voice and joyfully follow your instructions. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord Jesus, to you. Take, Take our moments and our days and let, let them flow in endless praise. Take our hands and let them move at the impulse of your love. Take our feet and let them be swift and beautiful for you. We are honored to be your prayer warriors seeking, serving, and saving alongside of you. And now if you would join us as we commit this hour of worship into the hands of God. Father God, we are so grateful to gather this morning and we pray that you'll be pleased with the worship we offer you today. Although we enjoy gathering together, although we enjoy singing and being a part of a faith community, we realize that all of that is really meant to be for your honor and for your glory and for your enjoyment. And so all of us together remind ourselves that we are here to worship the living God, an audience of one. And so we commit ourselves and we commit that all that we are a part of today will be for you, that it will bring you pleasure and bring you glory. We pray it this morning in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, I Must Tell Jesus.
Our theme this morning is prayer, and we've been focusing on a portion of Scripture out of Acts chapter 2, and uh, this will be the fourth sermon in that series. And so as we prepare uh, to focus on this theme, if you would join us this morning in singing Spirit of the Living God, let's sing that together. It is a joy this morning to have Danny Moore with us, and Danny's going to be sharing testimony with us this morning. Thank you, Danny. Testimony. What does that mean? In the religious experience, it means a public recounting of a religious conversion or experience. And what I'm going to share with you today is a experience, the most important experience I've ever had in my life. And it will have happened 15 years ago, this coming September the 5th, 2005, when I went to a hospital in Oklahoma City to have a brain tumor removed. Uh, for months before that, and before they knew what it was, I kind of lived in a fog or a haze. And once I got through that experience, I decided to sit down and put in words what that experience meant to me and I'm gonna read it verbatim as I shared that experience with the people I work with at Quality Integrated Services, or as most people know them as QIS. Lonnie and Nancy Childress owned that business and they were so very supportive of me during that period of time. So as I read this letter, I hope that you will listen and it will be from Christmas time, that Christmas immediately after my surgery. In the spirit of Christmas, I wanted to share the following with you. What you're about to read is as much about you as it is me. And to be truthful, it is not about me and you, but about God and our lives. We pretty much get up each day and go about our lives with an occasional thought about God and where he stands in our lives. We have jobs, families, and a whole lot of things on our minds. We so often do not give him time, and certainly not enough of it in our lives. Unless, of course, when things go wrong or we have problems we can't seem to handle ourselves. In those times, we finally get in touch with him to help us. Well, if you wonder if God has time for you, reading the following might reinforce just how much God is always with us, even when we do not think he is. As some of you know, or may not know, I had a major medical problem in 2007. There's a lot more to that story than the one you were, were familiar with after my surgery. I will try to recount it as accurately as I can because what happened has left a mark on my life forever. On September 5, 2007, I reported at 5 a.m. to St. Anthony's Hospital to be prepped for surgery. 
Only about two weeks earlier, I had been diagnosed with a brain tumor and surgery was necessary. I had been recommended to a young surgeon, Dr. Christopher Berry, who practices surgery at St. Anthony's in Oklahoma City. Prior to surgery, he gave me, Becky and my family, an overview of the surgery and what to expect with the process. I had never had any type of surgery in my life, but at this point I knew something had to be done because my life was a haze at times. I could no longer function well at work or at much of anything else. In hindsight, there are parcels of time I still do not clearly remember from the immediate months before my surgery. But strangely, I remember almost everything proceeding and after this event. At about 6.30 to 7 a.m., I remember the family prayer before being wheeled down the hall to surgery. I remember my wife's words of encouragement as I was moved to surgery. I remember how very cold surgery was before the very warm heated blanket was put on me and the sleep doctor put me out. The next thing I remember was being awakened immediately after surgery as I was being wheeled down the hall to recovery. I heard them calling me and I responded. The rest of the day was a whirl with nurses coming in and out and my family visiting as well as Lonnie and Nancy. I remember it all especially, the massive headache I had for much of the day. The evening of the 5th, my immediate family went back to their hotels. Becky said goodnight and I tried to rest. It is interesting what happens to the brain when a load is released and things start working pretty normally again. I slept in bits and pieces as, as I was awakened every hour to squeeze my nurse's hands, to raise my feet, and to have my eyes looked at, so sleep was tough to come by in any form. Finally, I did get some sleep and remember waking at about 5.30 a.m. the 6th of September to the sound of chimes at the half hour. My room was across from the nurse's station and they could easily view me in my room. <laughs> there was light that reflected off my room wall and as a result, <laughs> pardon me, as a result I could see on the wall the crucifix of Jesus shining in the light. At that very instance, I felt the overwhelming power and presence of God. And I felt the power of the prayers people had been praying for me. You have to understand, people told me and my family they were praying for me. Praying for others is something I had done numerous times, but now I am, was the benefactor of all those prayers and I could actually feel the power of them, the sheer force of their positive impact on my being. Those prayers to God had made a difference in my life. Yes. It was the most amazing feeling I had ever had. A feeling, a feeling I wanted to share with everyone I knew. It took me some time to tell Becky about the event. It was the most emotional event in my life. I did not know quite how to share it. Sharing it was difficult and brought tears and a broken voice as I tried to explain it to my wife. How was I to tell Jesus how much, how much their unselfish prayers meant to my life? But I made God a promise that morning that I would share it. The message is God is in our lives. He is, he is never away from us. He goes where we go. He knows what is on our minds at all times. He sees us in the best and worst of times. He knows what is in our whole hearts and souls. He knows when we are hurting, we are suffering, and when we do not know how to deal with life's problems, he is always there for us, even when we ignore or fail to realize his presence in our lives. He loves us unconditionally just as we love our own children, only he goes far beyond our human ability to comprehend how much he cares for each of us individually. Within seconds of seeing the crucifix that morning, all these things went roaring through my mind, and I felt so fortunate that God was there and heard the voices of those that had prayed for me. God is always with you, 
you are never alone. Call on him, talk to him, pray to him, and he will answer you. God always answers our prayers in the way that is best for us. Prayers can get us through this world and into his world. Thank you for your prayers, and may God bless you. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. What a powerful testimony. And isn't it so true that in our busy lives, we might forget God? We might even think that God doesn't exist or that he's not around. But God doesn't forget us. God doesn't give up on us. And when we need him the most, he does show up. He is right there to bring a peace, a joy, a healing, a helping hand. The scriptures reassure us our God is a very present help in our time of need. We now have opportunity to give into the life and ministry of the church. I'm so grateful to belong to Victory Memorial United Methodist Church, the spiritual family that makes up this congregation and the ministries that we are a part of right here in Guymon, but far beyond Guymon, all throughout this panhandle of Oklahoma. And God has opened up so many wonderful opportunities for us to minister in other countries. And so I want to assure you that the giving that comes into the life of the church is used as wisely as we know how to further the gospel and to share the love of Christ with others. There are instructions on how you can give online. Of course, you can also write a check, mail it in or drop it off here at the church. And I once again want to thank all of those who have faithfully invested in the life and ministry of Victory Memorial and the gospel that we are able to share with others. If you would bow your heads, uh, our scripture today comes out of Luke 6, verse 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you you get back. Lord, as we respond to that scripture, we realize that all we are and all we have is a gift from your hand. You are a most generous God and you are a very present help in our time of need. Thank you for all your blessings. And as each of us now has opportunity to return tithe, almsgiving, investment into evangelism, I pray that you'll take every dollar, every cent, and use it to bless the lives of others. Bless the gift and bless the giver. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please join me and join us as we sing together the doxology. with us special music on her trumpet.
Thank you, Sandy, for that beautiful solo. Thank you, Phyllis, for your accompaniment. It is now time for our children's conversation, and I want to invite all the children to please draw near as we take special time together to focus on this theme of prayer. I guess all of us as children have had opportunities to say prayers. We might be eating a meal together, and we might say a prayer at the table before we eat. And for many of us, there's a practice of saying prayers before you go to bed at night, where maybe mom and dad will join us, and we say our prayers. When we talk about prayer, it's a lot bigger than just saying prayers. The saying of prayers is really about a relationship each of us has with God. It's our willingness to acknowledge God. It's our willingness to listen for God's voice as he speaks to us and leads us throughout our lives. And it's opportunity for us to speak back to God. The saying of prayers is really a conversation talking to God. And so for us to think about what that looks like, I've brought a plant with this morning into worship. And I love potted plants and I'll have some in my office, and I have some at home, and all throughout my life, they've been a part of our home, or a part even of uh, the business environment, because uh, plants, and especially flowers, uh, help remind me of God's goodness, and maybe even more importantly, of the love that plants reveal to us. So this this little palm that I have in my office, I care for often. I'll make sure it has enough water. Occasionally, I'll give it a little fertilizer so that it has enough mineral to stay green and healthy. And I've got it in the windowsill where it gets enough light so that it can keep growing. Now, if I forget to water that plant, it won't be long and the leaves will start wilting and if I leave it without water long enough, it will die. That life that is in that plant will finally dry up and die. And if I don't keep it in the light where it can receive uh, the energy from the sun to keep growing, it will start wilting. And if I put it in the dark eventually, it will die. And if I forget to give it mineral, or if I give it too much all at once, it will finally wilt and die. That plant needs consistent water, consistent sunlight, consistent mineral, so that it can keep alive and grow. And I think it's the same with prayer. Prayer is not something you can do just once in a while, and uh, <laughs> maybe if you will forget about God, that God is real, and uh, believe that that relationship with God will stay healthy and strong. If we do not have a regular conversation, a regular prayer life with God, if we don't listen for God's voice and share what is in our lives with God, then that friendship, that relationship with God wilts. And finally, it dies if we don't pay attention to it. So just like the watering, just like the mineral, just like the sunlight, each of us needs to keep a daily conversation, a daily relationship that allows us to grow in that friendship and that love that God longs for in our lives. To illustrate this morning and to remind us, I want us to sing together a little song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And I pray that when you think of prayer, you'll remember the plant and how it needs constant and daily care if it's going to stay healthy and grow. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. And you grow, grow, grow. And you grow, grow, grow. Read your Bible.
people pray every day and you grow grow sing with us once more now read your bible pray every day pray every day pray every day Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, 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 and you grow, 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 and you grow, grow, grow. Now read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow. And now if you'll bow your heads and pray with me. Lord, we want to thank you this morning for the beauty of nature, the trees, the plants, the flowers, all of these created by you, all of these needing sunlight in order to grow and stay alive, all of these needing water, that without water they wilt and die. All of these needing the minerals that you've placed in the soil so that they can stay strong and healthy. And in a similar way, you have given us your word that speaks to us, that feeds our soul, that guides us. You have given us the privilege of a daily conversation with you that we call prayer, where we can talk and share and ask for help. And so we pray that each of us would commit to daily scripture reading and study to daily prayer so that we can develop that strong lasting relationship with you the living God help us to read our Bibles and pray every day we pray it in Jesus name and everybody said amen Amen. as we get ready to read God's word we're going to pray together a prayer for illumination And if you would pray with us, you'll see the words up on the screen. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy and obey with gladness what you say to us today. Amen. For the last four weeks, we have been looking at the scripture that is found In Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 42 to 47, and this portion of scripture is the gospel continued as the disciples have followed Jesus, have learnt from Jesus, have witnessed his betrayal, his crucifixion, and remarkably his resurrection back to life. Now they realize that Jesus is asking each of them to live out the good news and share it with others. And of course, it's 2,000 years later, and here we are, the followers of Jesus, and that same message, that same mission is ours. So we're going to read the text together, and we're going to focus this morning on prayer, uh, the fourth of the practices that the disciples engaged in as they lived out the gospel. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I have a couple of questions again that I would like for you to think about, and maybe you could even discuss them with your family and friends at home. What are your thoughts, feelings, and habits of prayer? Second, how have you experienced God's presence and provision through prayer? And number three, how do you practice 
listening for God's voice in response to your prayers. In our scripture, the focus has been devotion. They devoted themselves. And I've mentioned in each of the previous sermons that devotion speaks of a commitment, a daily, if you will, engagement in each of these practices. Very similar maybe to someone who would be committed or devoted to a job where you get up every morning, get yourself ready, go to work, work as hard as you can at your job in order that you might earn the money you need to pay for your bills or care for your family in order maybe to become uh, proficient at whatever the job is so that you can advance in order that you might become a, a gift. Uh, let's use a doctor, for instance, who uh, spends all of those years uh, in education, in training, and then finally gets out and not only makes a living but becomes a gift to others, a devotion to a career. And we know of people who are devoted, if you will, to sport. Every chance they get, they might be out on the golf course playing golf because they love the game and they're devoted to it. Or maybe somebody who likes to fish, spending a lot of time on fishing gear, a lot of time on a boat and a lot of money to finally get out there on the lake and enjoy fishing. In a similar way, we read of these early disciples being devoted to four practices. The first is to study, to learn from the apostles what the teachings of Jesus were, what the life of Jesus was all about, what his mission was all about. They were committed to learn from the apostles all that they could about Jesus and his mission. Secondly, they were committed to fellowship, to this friendship with Jesus and a friendship with one another, the family of God. They built long, deep, lasting friendships with others who were following Jesus. And last week, we focused on sacraments, especially the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, those two very special um, events that Jesus uh, participated in, and if you will, that he himself instituted baptism, the formal entry into the life of the church, and the breaking of bread or the Lord's Supper, which is a remembrance of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Today, the fourth of the practices is prayer. And prayer is one of those essential elements that each one of us has to engage in constantly if we are going to stay close to God and alive to God's purpose. I'll never forget when I was a new believer, uh, my brother Tim and I, I had the privilege of meeting a family who were very devoted to prayer. In fact, we thought it was a little weird. I'll tell you what happened. We spent a day with them, and when we got there, it wasn't long, and we ate a meal together, and sure, at the table, they said a prayer. And we visited, and uh, we shared uh, some needs that were in our uh, lives and in our circle of friends and they said well why don't we pray about those and sure enough right there they prayed about those needs and a little later on we were, go, uh, we were going on a trip and they said listen before we go let's say a prayer and we joined in and said the prayer and we took the trip and when we got to where we were going safely they said why don't we thank the Lord that he's brought us here safely and Tim and I looked at one another and kind of with a big old question mark on our faces and sure enough, we said a prayer of thanks to God for bringing us safely to our destination. And throughout the day, whenever there was an opportunity, they would include God and we would pray. It was a part of their lives. When we finally got home, my brother Tim and I said, you know, those people are the prayingest people we've ever been around. I mean, there's hardly an event in the day that they're not thinking about God or praying. Um, we said prayers at the dinner table. And if there was something really important, we might pray, but prayer just wasn't the currency of every day and every event. Well, I'm glad to mention now, 40-some years later, that that way of life has become my way of life. As I've discovered this relationship with Jesus and with our Father in heaven and with the Holy Spirit, their presence 
and their involvement becomes a daily practice, a daily adventure. It's not like God just shows up once in a long while and it's almost a surprise that there is a God and that he's a part of my life or your life. No, in the words of Jesus, he promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. He promised that he would be involved in our lives 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and some people will even add 365, 365 days of the year. He is always with us. He is interested and involved in everything that happens. So when we are maybe forgetful, neglectful, maybe even when we are dismissive of who Jesus is and what he means to us, he doesn't give up on us. He is still present in our lives. He is still listening for our cry. His arm is reaching out to touch us and heal us and help us even when we have not really invited or acknowledged or accepted his help. In fact, Jesus said something remarkable. The goodness of God is poured out on the righteous and the unrighteous, the deserving and the undeserving, those who acknowledge him and those who reject him. His love is big enough to be extravagant and generous toward all. Now, of course, God longs for us to acknowledge that he is God. He longs for us to welcome him and invite him into our lives and into our daily activities, our daily affairs. He wants to be a part of everything. And if we'll study the Acts of the Apostles, we'll discover that that kind of relationship developed in each of them. There's a point in the journey when the disciples have been around Jesus long enough that they realize he has something special in his relationship with the living God. The way he prays, the way he worships, the way he ministers is extraordinary. And so they'll come to him and say, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Now, I want to assure you that they'd been a part of prayers for most of their life, if not all of their lives. And they had said prayers. But there was something about the way Jesus prayed. There was something about the relationship he had with the Father that was far beyond anything they had ever seen. And so they come and ask him to teach them how to pray. And it's at that point that he actually teaches them that model prayer, the disciples' prayer or the Lord's prayer that we pray when we worship together. But it's once again not just a form prayer. It's not just a saying prayers to God. It's a special invitation to acknowledge God as creator, as father, as a part of their lives. And each of them go deep and become strong in that relationship with the living God. In fact, when Jesus ascends, he tells them to wait and gather together and pray. And as they wait... And as they gather and as they pray, God is preparing them to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who won't now just be around them, but the Holy Spirit will come and fill them, will empower their lives, will remind them of all the things Jesus taught, will give them a special anointing to live out the life of Jesus as his followers. Their whole way of life will become a prayer life. I like to talk of that kind of prayer life as becoming a prayer warrior. Somebody that is close to God. Somebody that is equipped by God. Somebody that is aware of God's presence all day long and is ready to engage in whatever activity or warfare that God would see fit to send them into. I'm reminded of a revival that I was a part of 11 years ago. I'd invited a special guest speaker and uh, Cecil was sharing some of his own faith journey. And uh, on that last uh, night of the revival, uh, he started sharing a special season of prayer that God had called him and his congregation to. Uh, they would gather every morning, early in the morning before work would start while it was still dark and uh, they would read scripture and they would sing and they would pray together and they were asking God 
for a special intervention. They were asking God for a power in their lives. And day after day, week after week, month after month, for a couple of years, they would meet faithfully through the summer, through the fall, the cold winters. He told me their church wasn't warm during the winter. They hadn't put on any heaters to keep the church warm. So when they got there in the winter, it was particularly cold. And you'd have to make sure you sang with a lot of enthusiasm and prayed because the the building was cold. But throughout the winter, they would meet into the spring year after year. And um, several years into that practice, the Lord had shown up in a special way among them one morning. A Pentecost occurred among them. They were Methodists. They were people of devotion to Scripture and people now devoted to prayer, people who read the uh, Scriptures faithfully each day and wanted to be a part of worship. But some of the signs and wonders that uh, God spoke of in the Scriptures had not been a part of their lives, and most of them were not looking for that to be a part of their lives. But all of a sudden, uh, several of their members just were overwhelmed by the presence of God. A couple of them even started speaking in tongues that morning. And he was the pastor, and he got concerned. You know, he kind of said to the Lord, Lord, we're Methodist. We don't do this. What is this? But he said the presence of God was so powerful and overwhelming that he knew this was a visitation by God and God's purpose. And he said it wasn't for the signs and the the wonders. It was for the empowerment and the mission that God had called them to be a part of. He said from that day on, those prayer warriors became instruments in God's hands that accomplished some amazing things in their community. They had a lot of gang violence. Through those members and through his ministry, God finally led those gangs to reconcile with one another, and the gang violence ended. There were a lot of uh, teenagers who were living reckless lives, a lot of juvenile delinquents in the neighborhood, They were led by God to open up a youth center and God gave them favor and they gathered at that youth center and many of those young juvenile delinquents came to saving faith, became devoted followers of Christ. Their community was impacted and changed in a wonderful way. Well, while he was talking, uh, the Lord kind of nudged me and said, David, I'd like you to start early watch prayer. And whenever God speaks to me like that, it's real clear. I know it's the Spirit of God speaking, and I kind of had a debate with God right there in the revival service. I said, Lord, I'm really busy. I I wake up early to start with, about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I go right up until 11 or 11.30. Lord, I just don't see my way clear to wake up like at 4.30 in the morning. I mean, I I already have a busy schedule. I need my sleep. And after I'd given him all the reasons I thought that wasn't a good idea, I heard him say again, David, I'd like you to start that early watch prayer and I'd like you to start tomorrow. So I had nothing more to say. I just sat there and he finished the sermon and we had a prayer time and we spent about 30 minutes praying for people. It was a wonderful response. And uh, as we were packing up later on, getting ready to end the night, I looked at Cecil and I said, Cecil, would you be willing to join me tomorrow morning in early watch prayer? And he paused and he said, "Um, I'm not doing that anymore. I mean, I'm not practicing that early watch prayer. That was in a previous season. I said, I know. But I heard the Lord kind of nudge me and say, he'd like me to start uh, early watch prayer. And would you be willing to join me tomorrow morning? Okay. Now, when I went to bed... It was close to 12 o'clock that night. I was dog tired. I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to feel when I wake up at 4.30. I'm going to set my alarm, but uh, okay. I want you to know at 4.30, when I woke up, my eyes were wide awake. I had energy. I didn't feel, sometimes if I don't sleep enough, I feel kind of almost like I'm in a stupor. I'm dragging. I don't feel good. But boy, I was alert. I got there. Cecil met me. We had a wonderful hour. We sang, we read, we prayed. In fact, there was such a a joy in that meeting that he and I decided we'd walk around the reservoir for another hour, talking, praying, sharing. 
And um, I uh, contacted a few of my uh, members and said, if any of you are interested, tomorrow morning we're going to continue this early watch prayer at five o'clock. And boy, was I surprised. I had two or three additional members show up at five o'clock. That's 11 years ago. And uh, for 11 years, we have met uh, every morning, Monday through Saturday, five o'clock to six o'clock for early watch prayer. And uh, I had a friend in the church who said, Pastor, really? Five o'clock? You know, God is awake at eight o'clock. Why do you want to meet at five o'clock? I said, I guess I'm meeting at five o'clock because the Lord asked me to. I really didn't want to. And I told him I was going to be dog tired, but you know what? I wasn't. And I had a busy schedule. And for the next two weeks, there wasn't a whole lot that I could change about my schedule. But for all of those two weeks, God gave me energy and joy. I never woke up one morning feeling tired, even though I was sleep deprived. After two weeks, I could realign my schedule so that I could go to bed at a decent hour, about nine o'clock, 9.30. And God has put me in a rhythm that allows me to do that. And I want to say with great joy this morning that there hasn't been a single morning that I've regretted having that hour carved out a priority for God. I'm so glad He invited me to spend that hour with Him. And the relationship has deepened. My walk has grown strong and joyful. The Lord has taught me so many wonderful things. I've got to spend incredible relationships with people, dozens of people, over those 11 years that have been a part of that. Now, I'm not saying you must wake up at 4.30 and you must pray at 5 o'clock, but I am saying this. If you want a life-giving, life-changing, dynamic relationship with God, you've got to engage in active prayer every day. Whenever you do that, however you do that, it's a 24-7 relationship. For me, that time has become protected time, precious time, and it's an inbuilt part of my life so that I can make God my first priority. I have committed myself to seek God first, to listen for His voice, to do what He asks me to do. I have devoted my life to following Jesus. And I want each of those four practices to be a daily part of my life. Studying, fellowshipping, the communion with God, the breaking of the bread, the, the, the deep intimacy with Him, and of course the prayer life. And so I want to leave a challenge with you. Will you be devoted to God? Not just to saying prayers, not just to attend worship, not just to try to be a good person, but will you seek the kingdom of God first? Will you seek a right relationship with Him first? Will you devote yourself like those early disciples to those practices of study, of fellowship, of breaking bread, of prayer, in order that you might become intimate with God, that He might empower you, that He might use you as His instrument? He's longing to do that. He's standing ready to meet with you and help you and use you. But it requires each of us to surrender. I hope that you will become a prayer warrior, somebody that knows the sweetness of the presence and the power of God in your life, somebody that's on ready to do whatever God asks you to do. We're going to end this sermon with one of my favorite hymns, Sweet Hour of Prayer. The words are up on the screen. Please sing with us.
Now we have the life application, maybe the most important part of worship, where you and I decide what we're going to do with what God has said and this invitation that God has given us. So I must ask you a question. What are you devoted to? If someone would study your life for a week or a couple of weeks, what would they find out about your life? Are you devoted to money? Are you devoted to sport? Are you devoted to your job? Are you devoted to fishing or hunting? What is it that characterizes your love, your devotion, your investment? God is asking you and asking me to make Him our first priority, to be devoted to Him, to know Him, love Him, follow Him, trust Him, serve Him. And only you can make that choice. Only you can be willing, if you will, to take your life and consecrate it, offer it to God and say, Lord, I want to be such a friend. I want to be such a son or daughter, one who is fully committed to seeking you, waiting on you, serving you. And so I want to challenge you. There's a lot of talk about prayer. But for many, there's very little actual praying going on. Like my brother Tim and I, we see people doing a whole lot of praying and we think, that's kind of weird. I mean, you can say a prayer once in a while, but really, to have God involved in everything, is that really necessary? And I want to say, absolutely. If you're going to seek God and a right relationship with God, then you need to include Him in everything. Be quick to say thank you. Be quick to ask God for help. Study His Word so you'll know what He expects and then do what His Word teaches you to do. So I challenge you, become a prayer warrior. Become somebody who is committed to study, to fellowship, to breaking bread, to prayer so that your life will become intimate with God, powerfully filled and used by the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing together in preparation for our time of intercession. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. The words will be up on the screen. Please join us and let's make a commitment to seek God and be prayer warriors.
Please join us in intercessory prayer as we remember all that God has done and as we pray for the needs of others. Lord, the first response this morning is to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What a marvelous God you are. You are a great, big, wonderful God, always victorious, always watching over us, listening for our cry, reaching out to help us. And so collectively we say, thank you, God. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for showing up. Thank you for being willing to become the Lamb of God who would take away our sins. Thank you for the power, Holy Spirit, to raise Jesus from the dead, that he is now our risen Savior and Lord. Thank you for hearing our many prayers and answering so faithfully. As Danny shared in his testimony, thank you for being there when he went through that brain surgery. Thank you for uh, empowering and equipping that surgeon to do the surgery. Thank you for all the medical folk. Thank you for seeing Danny through that scary time. Thank you for showing up in that powerful way in the room the next morning when he knew you were there and that your hand was upon him. Thank you for watching over him every day of his life. You are the God who never leaves us. You are the God who never forsakes us. What a faithful God you are. Lord, I thank you for Neil Heyer and his growing strength and recovery. You have watched over him this difficult year as he has fought against this leukemia. Thank you that Mike Denny is feeling better. They've stopped the chemo and he's starting to feel better, Lord. Thank you for watching over Mike these five years as he has fought this awful battle against cancer. We continue to speak your healing, your help, your blessing on Mike and his family. Thank you for uh, Larry Wiggins and the surgery he came through and his recovery. Thank you for Patsy Ayers and the way she's uh, dealing with this renal failure. Thank you for Lois Boston and 107 years and the, the surgery with uh, her broken hip and her recovery. Thank you for all the care that's happening right there in the manor and the heritage. Thank you for your hedge of protection around them. Thank you, Lord, for the many who've recovered from this awful coronavirus. Thank you for those who are serving day and night uh, to help heal and uh, protect and provide for those who are affected by the virus, for those who are trying to keep themselves safe. Lord, thank you for the food we eat, the clothes we wear. Thank you for the homes we live in. Thank you that you are a God who is keeping a watchful, loving uh, God over our lives. Like a good shepherd, your eyes are ever on us. And Lord, we want our hearts to be toward you. We want our lives to be devoted to you. We ask you for healing. We ask you for help. We ask you for daily provision. Be our God and make us your people, the sheep of your pasture. As all of us together join in that wonderful prayer that you taught your disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you would now join us in our final hymn, as we sing together, He Hideth My Soul, the words will be up on the screen.
now as we leave worship and as we enter into the mission field that God has placed each of us within, I want to share with you God's blessing and God's challenge that comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 11. Finally, brothers, and of course, sisters included in that, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. We're going to leave up for you the information on our church, the address, and the online giving if you would like to be a part of that. Thank you so much for joining us in worship.